This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. A warning to our listeners, to our viewers, to our readers, this next segment includes discussion of sexual assault. Here in New York, former Columbia University gynecologist Dr. Robert Haddon has been sentenced to 20 years in prison on federal sexual abuse charges. The sentencing comes after Haddon was convicted in January of luring patients across state lines to appointments here in Manhattan, where he sexually assaulted them. U.S. District Judge Richard Berman handed down the maximum prison sentence Tuesday, calling the case unprecedented because of Haddon's hundreds of victims and how his abuse continued for two decades at Columbia. U.S. Attorney Damian Williams called Haddon a predator in a white coat, whose victims, quote, trusted him as a physician only to instead become victims of his heinous predilection, unquote. One of the survivors, Evelyn Yang, the wife of former Democratic presidential candidate Andrew Yang, wrote, quote, to this day, I'm still waiting for Columbia University to notify former patients that a now twice convicted sex offender worked at Columbia for 20 plus years. They've been saying that that's not their responsibility, but how does that make sense? Yang asked. After Haddon was found guilty in January, Evelyn Yang responded to the verdict on a CNN exclusive interview. I feel such relief um, and gratitude, you know, the fact that we almost had a second chance at it, right? So the first time he was convicted, he basically got a slap on the wrist. And this time, I feel like it was the first time in this trial that a fuller extent of his crimes were presented and considered. Lawyers representing survivors say Columbia University had a long history of ignoring Haddon's behavior in order to protect its reputation instead of acting in the victim's interests. So far, Columbia and New York Presbyterian Hospital paid out $71 million lawsuit in 2021 to 79 former patients and $165 million in 2022 to 147 former patients. In 2016, Haddon pleaded guilty in New York State court to abusing two women as part of what survivors called a slap-on-the-wrist plea deal with the then Manhattan District Attorney's Office, Cy Vance. Uh, Haddon lost his medical license but avoided prisoner probation. In response to advocacy from survivors, last May, New York State passed the Adult Survivors Act, which created a special one-year look-back window to allow individuals who are 18 or older when they were sexually assaulted in the state to file a lawsuit against the person who harmed them and or the negligent institution. The act was enacted November 24th last year. Now lawyers are filing another round of lawsuits under the New York Adult Survivors Act. We're joined right now by two guests who are former patients of Dr. Haddon. Lori Maldonado attended the trial of former Columbia University um, Dr. Haddon and gave testimony in January before he was remanded. He was a gynecologist—she was a gynecology and then an obstetrics patient of Haddon's between 2003 and 2012. And Marissa Hochstetter gave a victim impact statement during the federal trial of Haddon. In 2015, she reported Dr. Haddon to the Manhattan DA, Cy Vance, and became one of the first people to speak out against Haddon publicly. She was a patient of Haddon's from 2010 to 2012. We welcome you both to Democracy Now! Marissa, let's begin with you. Your response to the 20-year sentence that Haddon received and what you're pursuing now. Well, thank you so much for that introduction and for having us. Um, you know, it, it is an important milestone in a, in a year's-long quest for justice. Uh, Haddon is someone who has received special treatment and really continued to evade accountability for a very long time. Um, so it is certainly um, a sort of vindication and, and gratifying to, to see that sentence, to be there. Um, but ultimately, uh, prison for someone like him does not get at the institutional accountability and does not repair the harm done to me and uh, many other people. But it is, uh, it was really something incredible to witness. Mm. Uh, and I wanted to um, also ask Lori Maldonado, you were in the courtroom um, when uh, Robert Haddon was sentenced 
talk about your response, first to the guilty verdict. And now, you were not one of the uh, people involved in this case, but you did get to testify. That's very interesting. And if you could explain why. Thank you, Amy, uh, for having us. Um, it's an honor to be on Democracy Now! and to bring light of this issue. Um, it's so great to hear Evelyn's voice before. Um, um, just she has notified so many women, um, and to have Marissa on here with me, I'm so inspired by um, so many of these women. Um, you had asked about uh, my response um, to to the trial, um, and really, it was a step towards justice. Um, Marissa and I and many survivors were in the courtroom. Um, there were nine that um, testified, um, and brave, courageous women were cross-examined, um, and that's what, what, what the jury gave the verdict on. And then we had the opportunity, um, Judge Berman gave the women the opportunity um, to give testimony to Haddon and to him. Um, and so a lot of us women, um, it just, we, it was powerful, it was intense. Um, and we were really able to share our stories, um, and we were validated and heard. Um, and that was just a really big um, part of, of the experience, um, and just grateful. I, I later found out that Judge Berman um, was a social worker and got his MSW um, from Fordham, and I'm a social worker. And so I really appreciate um, how he held um, the, the case um, and just allowing to, to have survivors to come forward. Laurie, if you could share your story, whatever you feel comfortable with, how you came to be Dr. Haddon's patient, um, uh, you used him as a gynecologist for years, and then you became pregnant, and um, he was uh, an obstetrician gynecologist. Talk about what happened and how this process took place. I mean, we're talking about hundreds of women, right? Oh, Amy, um, I, the last time I heard 250 women, and now I think I've heard the number 340, um, and we think that um, it's hundreds. Um, so uh, this is a lot of women that were involved. Um, I first saw Haddon um, in 2003, about. Um, I was in my mid-20s, um, and, you know, I selected Haddon to be my OBGYN um, because it was at Columbia you know, University, New York Presbyterian Hospital. So that was this prestigious hospital. Um, and so I um, started that uh, relationship all the way up till 2012. So almost a decade, um, Haddon was my doctor. Um, I, like many um, women, you know, trusted Haddon with my care. Um, I trusted him with my well-being. Um, I thought he had my best in interest in mind. Um, and he was a sexual, a serial sexual predator um, that had really, um, you know, every, every visit was, was an opportunity for him to, to commit abuse and assault. Um, I think, you know, early on, there was lots of grooming behaviors, and, and we heard a lot of this from the, the um, testimonies that women gave. And the same thing for me, um, long breast exams, um, you know, um, a vaginal, ex a vaginal exams. He would say, asked inappropriate questions um, about your sex life. Um, he told me and he told many of the women um, that, oh, you know, you're, you're, um, you're, you have a tilted uterus, and so that just means I have to go a little bit deeper on the exams. Um, so, and part of that, of me being young, of this being uh, my first OBGYN, so not knowing the standard of care, um, that, that I didn't realize um, that each, each visit was, um, was abuse. Um, and, and were there so nurses in the room? If you can talk about that and also um, the fact that um, he yeah. didn't use gloves when he was examining you, um, this issue of saying you had a tilted uterus uh, made you, in an odd sense, more beholden to him because you thought you wanted to be pregnant, you wanted to make sure, and he talked with you about, um, you know, he could make sure that you would be pregnant. Yeah. Uh, thank you for, for asking those questions. Um, you know, exactly. So I, there, um, there was never a nurse um, that I can recall present in the room, or they might have done the first, um, you know, kind of the, the vitals and then had left the room. And so you were often alone with him. 
Um, he would often, you know, s say, oh, you have lots of moles. I just want to make sure they're not cancer. So it would be an opportunity for him, you know, to totally um, take you out of the gown. Um, and so there, there, there was a lot of, of that. Um, there's something to Amy of just, you know, really wanting to be pregnant. And I had miscarried um, earlier um, around um, before the birth of, of my son. And, you know, I, um, he had told me, oh, well, you know, you're, you're going to get pregnant. Um, you know, my um, predecessor invented the Rogam shot in the 1960s. And um, because you're RH negative, we're going to give the shot to you. And that will make it so you won't miscarry. So he would use knowledge, um, you know, where you would actually believe, like, he could be my only OBGYN um, because he's the only one that could deliver my baby. Um, so he, he really used knowledge, um, uh, you know, to kind of allure women into trusting him and having a long relationship. What happened when you were nine months pregnant? Uh, um, and just say what you feel uh, comfortable saying. Thank you. Um, I was um, uh, sexually assaulted by Robert Haddon two days before the birth of my child. I went in for, um, you know, my kind of, my, my checkup. My ex-husband was in the room with me, um, and we were just excited. I remember that in the office room, my, I went to the bathroom and the, my mucus plug had dropped, so I was really imminent away, away from the birth, and I, we were really excited. Um, and Haddon came in the room, and he had a glimmer in his eye, and I thought, that that glimmer was that he was excited like me for the birth, but now I realize it was an opportunity for him um, to commit sexual assault. And um, he, you know, I, he later said, "Oh, you know, one more thing, I I, um, I need to check you." And he took me behind the curtain, um, away from my husband, and put me on the exam table. And what I thought was, you know, that he was going to check my cervix um, just to make sure that the baby was okay, um, but that's not what happened. Um, <laughs> um, what did happen um, was Haddon um, used his hands to harm me, and he stuck his fist inside of my vagina, and it was so painful, and I screamed, um, and I cried out in pain. And um, he abruptly left the room. Uh, my husband uh, at the time uh, came over uh, to me, checked on me. He said, are you OK? Um, and I was like, no, I'm not OK. And then he asked me a really important question. He said, do you feel violated? And I said, yes. Um, and I think I, I, was, I felt violated. And I was confused because I didn't know if that was a medical procedure, um, you know, or, or what that was about. Um, so I was really, uh, you know, I couldn't stand. I had a tough time sitting. I couldn't eat. Um, I was really um, disturbed, you know. And at that moment, um, and I think this happens, you second guess yourself. Um, and later I understood that, you know, what I did was um, I repressed that uh, memory because um, I had to survive the moment, and I was giving birth in 48 hours, right? Um, that I was, I was in labor, and so my husband and I just kind of, um, you, we, we kind of, we, we focused on the labor. So you give birth to this beautiful baby boy. Uh, from that moment that he punched you, he disappeared. The doctor. He disappeared. Yeah. He didn't correct. deliver your son. And what did you come to understand after? And um, and this brings Columbia into the story. I mean, it was involved before, too, because you actually went to him because of that uh, sort of his elite credentials. Yeah. Um, uh, thank you. Um, I think so. Um, the, you know, when I went to see him, so I, I went a few visits after um, to see Haddon. And I remember that um, I showed up, and um, I was told that Haddon took a leave. Um, and that was it, right? And I saw um, another doctor 
um, who just said, hey, I, I noticed you were a longtime patient of Haddon. and I wanted to make sure you're okay, right? Um, you know, so never, you know, um, never kind of saying that Haddon was arrested, um, right? Never kind of coming forward and just seeing if I was okay in that moment. Um, so I think that that was part of it, right? That we were never notified. Um, the the way we were notified were people like Marissa and Diane Munson and um, Evelyn Yang. There's all these, that's how we were notified. Um, when I first realized um, the scale, this was about when my son was um, a few years old, between two and three, I was on the subway. And, um, you know, it was New York subway, commuting to work. And um, I saw the picture of Haddon that said, Gyno is a sicko. Right, and I had a panic attack on my way to work, realizing, you know, going back to that moment, realizing that was sexual assault, you know, realizing I had this this doctor for such a long time, um, and you know, just being in shock. We're talking to Lori Maldonado, who is right there at the sentencing of Dr. Haddon, uh, who testified um, at the trial. Marissa Hochstetter, you were there, too. Uh, you, too, a patient, a victim of Dr. Haddon. Uh, can you now take us forward, Marissa, um, because there's this larger issue. You've got the man who's going to prison for years, and then you've got the institution he worked for, and you have the fact that Haddon actually um, w did have a plea deal with the previous New York DA. Now it's Alvin Bragg, but before him was Cy Vance. And explain what you now understand was happening with Haddon, the number of people who had come forward and complained to Columbia. Yeah. Um, thank you, Lori, for, for sharing so much um, with us and with the audience. Um, I'm always in awe when I when I listen to you. Um, we know that Haddon saw something like six to 8,000 patients in his 20-plus year career uh, at Columbia New York Presbyterian Hospital. Um, I firmly believe that he went into this profession with the intent to uh, use his position of power and privilege and, and abuse people. So. I think as more continues to come out, uh, the institution has an obligation to at least inform patients of um, what they were exposed to. Uh, I don't know the names of those six to 8,000 patients, but they surely uh, could make a good faith effort to notify people. So uh, we know that they received um, at least one letter uh, in the early 90s uh, complaining from a patient, complaining about being sexually assaulted by him. They wrote back. Uh, the head of the department at the time acknowledged her letter and said he would look into it after his vacation, and he never did. Um, we heard nurses testify in the trial. We've had other people come forward. Um, we know that there were earlier settlements um, with victims, that they were forced to sign uh, NDAs. So uh, Columbia very much knew uh, about his behavior and ultimately, I think, was uh, just thinking only about their own liability. Um, you know, one thing that I think is important to note, and Evelyn has shared this in her story, but um, he was arrested in June of 2012 um, when someone uh, called the police about his behavior. And Columbia allowed him to come back to work uh, for about six or eight weeks, and he assaulted people during that period. So even if you put aside whatever has come forward about his you know, decades-long career, um, they very tangibly knew that he had been arrested for sexual assault by the New York Police Department and allowed him to continue working. Um, I, like Lori, uh, read some of the headlines, you know, in the New York Post, the New York D Daily News, and it felt very salacious. Um, it was validating in some ways because I knew I wasn't alone, but uh, it was not something that I really wanted to kind of speak publicly about. Um, I continued to follow the original criminal prosecution and ultimately did go forward to the Manhattan District Attorney's Office to report what had happened to me because I felt really strongly that the women who were involved in that not be alone. And I wanted to uh, make sure that I was using my voice to validate them, to support them, and to make sure that this person wouldn't practice again. Um, what you know, kind of 
in hindsight and looking back, this experience was happening kind of right before the Me Too movement. Uh, and then through the, the news reporting on Harvey Weinstein uh, and others really that the, the Manhattan DA at the time had really given preferential treatment to white men in positions of power who were accused of sexual assault. Um, I came to realize that the treatment that Haddon had received, while his name at the time was not famous, um, Columbia and his attorneys had really accessed that same sort of network um, of position and privilege. Uh, his attorney made a campaign contribution to Cy Vance on the day that the plea agreement was reached in 2015. Um, things like that that were were really hard to um, unsee. And so I never really set out wanting to talk about being sexually assaulted while I was pregnant, um, but I wanted to talk about the failure of the justice system. So I, I wanted I, yeah. to get your response to Columbia University and its affiliated hospitals announcing their $165 million settlement with 147 of Robert Haddon's former patients last year. Uh, Columbia University Irving Medical Center released this statement, saying, We deeply regret the pain that Robert Haddon's patients suffered and hope that these resolutions will provide some measure of support for the women he hurt. All those who came forward should be commended. We are committed to the safety and dignity of every one of our patients and have adopted policies to ensure that they are protected and empowered while in our care. So you've got that settlement of 167 million with Columbia. You've got another 171 million. I think it's up to 236 million, about a quarter of a billion dollars that Columbia has to pay out. Um, are you part of those two settlements, Marissa? Um, I'm not part of those settlements. I have a separate um, settlement agreement with Columbia. Um, the thing I would say about settlements is that um, a lot gets focused on the number, right? These are big numbers. They're mostly being paid by insurance companies. Um, I don't think that any of that is affecting the bottom line. Um, we have uh, not a lot of options to offer recourse to survivors. So um, even that, I think, you know, the number could be justifiably even higher. And I think it should continue to go up as more people um, seek uh, a resolution um, with them. You know, that statement you read uh, really only came after years, years of asking for some response from them. Um, before I spoke publicly, I asked for them to participate in a process whereby I could get a new birth certificate for my children that didn't have Robert Haddon's name, and they refused to speak to me. Um, their initial statements were much more distant from uh, what had happened. So one of the things I think through our public um, advocacy and really the passage of the Adult Survivors Act, which you, you mentioned in the introduction, um, kind of forced their hand. Um, when you remove statutes of limitation, uh, from the equation, um, they have to be much more responsible to the people coming forward. And just to be um, clear, so, are yeah. there a number of women who are suing him now as a result of what you pushed through the uh, adult, the New York Adult Survivors Act that Kathy Hochul, the governor, signed last year, which, by the way, separately allowed E. Jean Carroll to go back and sue former President Trump under? Correct. I mean, it um, really, the Adult Survivors Act was about putting the power back in the hands of survivors, all survivors. Um, of course, I was advocating for uh, women that I knew uh, assaulted by Haddon. Um, I, I think the number of additional lawsuits we'll see is in the hundreds. Um, you know, people focus on the numbers um, uh, of people coming forward. I think it's important to also acknowledge that the Adult Survivors Act forces the institutions to come to the table earlier in mediation. Um, so whether or not something actually becomes filed and um, goes to, to a lawsuit, you know, focusing on the number isn't always maybe the best measure, but uh, it gave a lot of leverage to a lot of survivors. And explain what you pushed through in the New York City Council and this issue with your twin daughters of not having Haddon's name on their beautiful birth certificate. Yeah, you know, it was really something uh, very sentimental and kind of emotional for me when I went to register them for kindergarten, and um, I pulled out this document that I needed to provide to the, the school district, and his name was there, um, name of attendant at delivery. Uh, not all states have this. Uh, if I had, you know, given birth at home, uh, could have been my husband's name on there, could have been a, you know taxi driver on the West Side Highway, but uh, it was his name. And um, 
I felt like this gut punch that um, this person who had harmed me and, you know, I had a C-section. Um, I, I think the most painful part often for me is that his hands cut open my body, reached in and took my children out. You know, he was the first person in the whole world to touch them. And that's not something I can change. And I just really did not want his name to remain on this document for them. I have to deal with the connection to him but I wanted to, to end that for them. Um, we have yeah. 10 seconds. Long story short, um, it mostly because Columbia would not provide uh, additional information to the state, it needed to be uh, legislated. And we passed a law that allowed for if doctors have lost their medical license, you can have their name redacted from these official documents. Well, Marissa Hochstetter and Lori Maldonado, the survivors of a now convicted and sentenced OBGYN. Thank you for joining us.